<clears throat> and for me to cancel this event would have been an insult to you and what you stand for and what you provide the college every single day that you work here and what you provide for each other in terms of making work fun, enjoyable, and when things aren't, you're not having a good day, somebody to talk to to help you get through that day. I was telling my diabolical side earlier in the week was saying, I'll just cancel the damn thing. Make this room dark, no chairs. And when they come in for their faculty meeting, they have no place to sit. But, um, but my wife reminded me, you don't do that. You know? <laughs> That's not you. And uh, like she always, damn, she's always right, you know. So anyway, <clears throat> I just want to share that with you because it's been, I went through all that range of emotions earlier this week in terms of what's the right thing to do. You know, I, <clears throat> I have the luxury at this point in my career I'm not worried about the next job. So there are things that I can do, there's a risk that I can take, there are decisions I can make that I don't have to be as concerned about job security as I am about making sure I'm focusing on doing the right thing because that's what's the most important thing. And I will not be intimidated and I will not be coerced by any individual or any group of people if I think it's going to prevent me from doing the right thing. And I just want you to know that. Because that's the only reason that I continue to do this job, is to make sure that we're doing the best that we can do for you as employees, but most importantly for our students. That we provide the absolute best experience from an instructional standpoint, from a service standpoint, from a facility standpoint, that we can possibly do. That's my promise to them. That's our promise to our communities. And that's my promise to you. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for drinking the water <clears throat> and hanging in there. You know, we all deserve more than we have. We know that. When we do salary surveys, we know that. And we do the very best we can to incrementally make things better. But the reactions that we make and the actions that we take are dependent upon our ability to generate adequate revenue so that we don't put the district at risk. And I'm responsible to five elected officials, our trustees. And they have the daunting task to make sure that this college stays fiscally sound and responsible. We're on, we were on accreditation sanction because of our fiscal instability. And that's no longer a recommendation. But it takes, it takes amazing diligence to keep focused on that financial security. So I, in all fairness, cannot go to our trustees and say, we need to, we need to uh, put a package on the table worth X percent or Y percent or Z percent, knowing that it's going to force us into a negative picture the following year, and then we're back into 2012, where we're lining up positions to eliminate. I will not eliminate positions for the sake of giving somebody else a raise. That is not okay. It was a horrible experience back in 2012, and I will not put the, the college in that, in that predicament again. No, how ma no matter how many signs are carried, buttons are worn, or protests that are made. Because okay. none of us deserve that. Many of us in this room are still reeling from two 5% furloughs that we've never made up. You know, I have never forgotten that. So. And it's also important to know that 
when you see that somebody gets something, somebody gets a bump of two ranges or whatever, and you think, gosh, that person's really lucky. What about me? That person, I know that person. They don't need a raise. You know? Don't ever judge anybody else's situation. You don't know whether that person is single, whether they have a family. Or you don't know what's behind the curtain. You don't know if they're taking care of elderly parents. You don't know if there's a significant illness in the family. You don't know if they have a special needs child. You don't know anything about their economic reality. So never judge anybody else's situation and make assumptions that they've got it better off than you. Trust me, I know so many circumstances within our quest of family that are excruciating in terms of what people are dealing with. So just keep that in mind when you start to feel sorry for yourself. And I look out in the public sector or the private sector and I see people fearful every day that they go to work of keeping their job, of what are they going to do about retirement because they don't have a retirement system, struggling to have health insurance or find health insurance or, or even to be covered. And we take it for granted. We take it for granted. We have a retirement system. We have health care. We don't have to worry about that. Yeah, we have to worry about paying for it because it gets, it gets more expensive and it takes a bigger chunk of our, of our discretionary pay. We know that. But we have the confidence that we can take care of ourselves and our family in that regard. So that's my welcome. <laughs> No, I just had to get it off my chest, so. Yeah. So, um, did somebody sneeze in this middle section here? Yeah. That's, of course, it's, it's the nursing. Yeah, it's a kind of, All right. <clears throat> That's for the late arrivals? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce two of the most important people that I have to work with, I get to work with, all the time. Because <laughs> um, they're the ones who really, they provide the parameters for which I can do this job. And that's our trustees. And so I'd like to introduce our newest trustee, who represents District 4, uh, which is the South County from AG South, and a former uh, chief of police for Cuesta College, uh, Mr. Pete Sizak. Pete, thank you for being here. <laughs> when I was the vice president of student services, and, and uh, Pete was the, the chief cop, and we were dealing, we'd deal with student discipline issues, I'd play the bad cop, he'd play the good cop. And it was kind of a role reversal and got the student really, really confused. You know, like, you don't know who to be. What's that? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also, it's been my privilege since I came back in six years ago to work with a really fine person and a really effective trustee, our current board president of our uh, board of trustees, uh, Mr. Pat Mullen. Pat, thank you for being here. Yeah. We have the most unique board in the state of California. Five-member board. Uh, oh, wait a minute, there's Richard. And I can't, I, we, now we have a majority, so they can't sit together, they can't talk. <laughs> and uh, I always love to see Dick on the board because uh, it takes me back to 1967. And this, uh, this gaucho from UCSB and this Mustang from Cal Poly linked up when we joined the faculty, uh, me in the math department and Dick in the history department. But it was really nice to see Dick come on board as, um, as a trustee representing uh, Area 5, which is the Atascadero uh, area. Uh, Pat's uh, District 3, which is uh, most of San Luis Obispo, and then it filters down to Avila Beach, uh, down to Grover Beach. So, that's why they kind of sit close to each other, because that's a Roy Grandy Grover kind of thing there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Dick Hitchman. Thank you, Dick. 
Yeah. And I can tell you, um, when I'm in close session, when I have my private time with the board, there's nobody that anguishes more about our current situation and about us as employees, as these individuals. They truly care. We have three trustees who are former employees, one faculty member, one foundation executive, one chief of police, and we have the other two members of our, of our trustees are alumni. Angela Mitchell from Paso Robles, who's an alum of Cuesta College and Cal Poly. Mr. Pat Mullen is an alum of Cuesta College and Cal Poly. So we truly have, we truly have trustees who are not there for political reasons. They're there because they really care. They care about Cuesta College. They care about our success. They care about what we do for students. And their, their charge is to make sure that we continue to deliver the mission that we're charged to do. So I appreciate that because I share that same passion, that same commitment. I don't have to worry about people who are using this as a stepstone to another political office. Those are, those are miserable people to work with. So. Anyway, all right, so <clears throat> thank you all for being here. And <clears throat> at this time, I'd like to um, recognize some uh, individuals who, some of whom are maybe here or not, but at least people who are, are leaving the Cuesta family through the uh, avenue of retirement. And uh, from the faculty, um, one of our longtime nursing faculty who has been heading up our licensed vocational nurse program forever, we actually talked her into not retiring earlier, <laughs> Uh, Marianne Ambrose, she'll be leaving us at the end of this uh, academic year in June. <clears throat> in the classified, <clears throat> um, these people have already retired, but Debbie Zumwalt left us in August, uh, Frank Pennock in August, Joyce Davenport left us in September, Edith Tway in October. Boy, is she happy. I just. <laughs> uh, Susie Gillette. And I'm not happy, because I loved working with Susie when I was teaching back in the math department uh, during my retirement. And, uh, and at the end of this month, uh, B. Anderson is going to walk off into retirement land. And uh, I think he's outside right now, but also our amazing chief of police, Joe Arteaga, is retiring at the end of February. So uh, we're in the process of uh, recruiting out to a new uh, public safety uh, director and, and chief of police. And last but not least, I almost, I almost failed to accept this resignation or retirement, but uh, my longtime colleague Sandy McLaughlin will be retiring at the end of June. So those are people who are going to be uh, <clears throat> leaving Cuesta College and taking with them a, a plethora of of good experiences and great value added <clears throat> that they've made to this uh, institution. So thank you all for your service. Um, <clears throat> but just as people leave, we have people come on board. And if you've been reading uh, my monthly newsletter, we're trying to feature people who have been leaving, uh, announce their retirements or resignations or people that we're bringing on uh, to Cuesta College. And so at this time, I'd like to um, have uh, the vice presidents uh, introduce people out of their areas that are new to the college. And so we'll start with Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Good morning. So in student services, these names, some will look familiar. So on this list are employees that are new to the college, but also employees who are in new positions. Uh, Alejandra Ag Aguirre, Allie, as we call her, Michelle Evans, Mary Elena Ramirez, Gina Barbosa, Mary Campos, who we refer to as Lainey, Micah Sweet, Karen Garza, Jan Romanazzi, Julietta Sue, Adrian Smith, and Lisa Samard. 
So welcome and in your to us or in positions and and we're really pleased to have you serving us. Thank you. Good morning. From administrative services, we have uh, the following people in facility services. Um, Mark Carroll, custodian. Catherine Agostini, custodian. Ronaldo Batista, custodian. And our bond fiscal analyst, Patrice Ely. Who's here. From information technology services, Sean Grometer, uh, multimedia electronics technician, Michael Beatty. Computer Services Technician, Frank Smith, Computer Services Technician, and Lori McLean, longtime Quest employee who moved to Database Administrator. From Facility Services, Diane Brigantz, Bond Fiscal Analyst. From the Bookstore, Cerise McGee, Purchasing Technician, Elizabeth Baker, Accountant. And from Public Safety, Megan Van Dalen, uh, Public Safety Secretary, Admin Assistant. Welcome. Good morning from Academic Affairs. We have some new employees. Um, would you please stand if you're here when I read your name? First is Eric Campos, and he's our athletic, athletic equipment technician. Anna Pez, a social science language and communications division assistant. Leslie Gomes is our library technician. Heather McElroy, physical science lab technician. Jennifer Noriega in our Student Equity and Success Center, a student services assistant. Hey, so we're very excited about that. Alicia and I in our Student Equity and Success Centers and our new Academic Success, success Coach. It's the first time we've had that position, so welcome. Uh, Shamara Janato. Shapara Janato. It should be HR up here, so you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to me to screw up, you know that. Uh, Sh Shanara, I'm very sorry. Are you here today? Yes. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, it, she's in our uh, Workforce and Econ Economic and Development and Community Programs Employment Services Coordinator. So, welcome. Jeremy Benincourt, Academic Site Coordinator. Melissa De La Cruz, and she's our academic site coordinator. Shirley Ron is workforce and economic development and community programs work experience coordinator. Tim Albertson, um, morning Tim, yeah, and he's our interim um, workforce and economic development and community programs associate director of continuing education and special programs. We like those long names at Quest College. Um, Mimi Feliciano Hicks, Foster Kinship Care Education Program Supervisor, and Gaila Jurovich, which is our new Small Business Deputy Sector Navigator. So welcome and have a good semester. And last but not least from the President's Cluster, we have uh, two uh, new individuals, uh, very recent uh, in payroll, as our payroll technician is Lori Garcia. Uh, she's not here right now because she is now working on getting all our W-2s out right now. So, yeah, so we can face that wonderful April experience. And then um, also new to the college uh, is our new Director of Grant Development who joined us uh, earlier in, in January, Janet Shepard. So Janet, over here, thank you. <clears throat> so as, uh, as you make your way around campus uh, and, you, and you see these individuals, you see a new name, uh, take the time and introduce yourself and uh, make sure people know who you are uh, so that we can you know, create a, a, a nice connection with them. Well, normally this part of the program we do awards, uh, faculty awards and also the very important Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award. And uh, the faculty are going to be making their awards at their meeting uh, later today, so we'll dispense with that at this time. Um, but I do want to take the time to make a presentation on behalf of Elaine Holly Coates. 
Many of us know Elaine. She uh, will be cel celebrating her 90th birthday this month, and there's going to be a, a rockin' party at Madan Inn on January 30th that her son is sponsoring, and um, she's fearful of that because she doesn't like parties, but she's, she's agreed to go with the flow because everybody else wants to honor her. Uh, anyway, Elaine was the very first Class Y employee hired at Cuesta College as the uh, assistant to the president, uh, Merlin Eisenbeis. And then she worked most of her career as the uh, assistant to the vice president of instruction. Um, then she retired, but she, that's kind of where I got my idea about not fully retiring is Elaine. Because every time I'd turn around, she'd be back on campus somewhere, you know. And spent a long time in the foundation working as an hourly until we went through the hourly issue and we had to consolidate into permanent positions. And so then she got exercised from the uh, organization, um, but still is very active. And um, we, I see her regularly. She comes to a lot of our events. We had a uh, retiree uh, brunch uh, a couple of Fridays ago up at North County campus. And we had about 60 uh, people come, retirees from all different eras. It was really, really nice. And Elaine was there. Dr. Martinez is there, who's now 94. Uh, it was really, really nice to see them. Uh, Dick and I, the old birds, you know, we were there too. So but it's nice to have people older than you attend an event. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so the Service Excellence Award is given to an employee who has gone and, we, and, and there are a lot of people in here who would fit this first description. It goes above and beyond what you are normally supposed to, what your job description says. But a lot of us do that. A lot of us go above and beyond, but it's the way we do it, the grace we carry with it, the emotion we carry with it, the, the selflessness that goes into the effort on behalf of other people. That's what we look for. They show professionalism. They provide support not only for colleagues, but, their, but for the students. And then they also inspire other people to do the same. So I'd like to announce at this time the, uh, the recipient of the Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award for 2016 is Karen Andrews. Karen, will you please? <laughs> Don't you dare upstage me. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I had the wonderful experience of being Vice President of Student Service for 14 years, and, and there's so many wonderful people that I got to know within, really more intimately, you know, within our classified staff who work in all of those support offices. And, and Karen was uh, one of those people that uh, when, when, I, when I first became really a, who Karen, aware of who Karen was, she was dealing with athletic eligibility, and I just saw how she gravitated to the caring about the students that she was serving. She went out of her way to make sure that the students were following, filling out the forms and making sure they got their tracers in, and, um, and just, it was just like she adopted them into her family. No offense to you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but that was kind of the spirit. And then when we launched our veterans program, we created our veterans center, man, there's no person better suited to take on that charge. 
and create that, not only just the services and the, having the door open and so on, but the love and care that goes into uh, welcoming individuals back into an education, an academic environment who are, are making that transition from, from a uh, military mode to a civilian mode. Some do it really well, very easily, and others struggle with it. Well, the anchor to making it successful is this wonderful lady right here. Uh, and it, her door just doesn't stop around the veterans. You'll see her at every other event, whether it's supporting EOPS or DSPS, or you name it, you have an event, Karen's going to be there, whether you want her there or not, you know. <laughs> but she will be there to lend that next uh, helping hand. So Karen, um, on behalf of your friends and colleagues, because they nominated you for this, and I had the, uh, the distinct honor of going through all the nominations, and uh, I felt you had the, the Elaine Coates heart. And so congratulations. And with it, comes this uh, physical recognition here. It says, Cuesta College Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award 2015-16, presented to Karen Andrews for distinguished performance and excellence in service. And this, uh, and this award is sponsored by the Cuesta College Foundation. And also with it comes an envelope. You know, not, it, there's no stamp on it though. But, <laughs> but in here is a, a, a cash award for this uh, particular event, you know, minus tax and license. Uh, but, but congratulations, Karen, and uh, thank you for being here. Did you want to say something? Did you want to say something? I just want to say thank you to everyone, but why my heart's in it is the vets deserve it. They put their lives on the, li on, you know, on the line for us, and when they come back, they're promised a lot of things, and they don't get what they're promised. So I just would do anything for a vet. So I hope everybody else will help them, too, because they deserve everything. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Karen. At this time, um, we have three topics that we want to uh, discuss with you that are relevant and current and important. Uh, we're going to be updating you on Major L, because we've got a lot of activity that's going to happen this spring, and we just want to paint the picture about where we are on the current projects and where we're going to be going uh, in the next six months. Um, also wanted to bring everybody up to speed in terms of what we're doing on that constant challenge about emergency preparedness and uh, what's, you know, what's currently been installed, where we're going, what, the, what training opportunities are. Several of you have been in groups that have been, gone through a training for emergency preparedness. Um, but we have a group that's going to uh, talk a little bit about that. And then also, you know, the community college system has been infused with a lot of money towards student success and student equity. And so when you see this list of hires, new people bringing on board, most of those new hires are in support of the student success and student equity movement. And they're being funded by that categorical, uh, those dollars. But we're on the hook for showing that our students are successful, that they're completers, that they reach their goal. And we're obligated to make sure that that happens and so com uh, completers and institutional effectiveness is how colleges in the future are going to be measured. Not necessarily how many people we have enrolled, you know, how many degrees we, uh, we have, that will be counting, but we have a lot of students that are here to finish certificates or a course or whatever, and we need to make them successful. So uh, Sandy McLaughlin is going to be bringing us up to speed from there. So at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Vice President Chris Green and Director of Facilities and Planning and Capital Projects, Terry Reese. And let's talk about Major L. Thank you.
Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Good morning again. We're going to start off our presentation with just a recap of how we got to where we are today. So you'll remember uh, we passed a general obligation bond in fall of 2014 for $275 million. The uh, money is going to be used for repairs, renovations, new construction, technology upgrades, and debt retirement. The, the bonds are going to be issued in uh, four different series, spread out three years apart. So we issued the first series last March for $75 million. That money is spent on the new, uh, is going to be spent on the new temporary buildings where we moved uh, faculty and services, mostly at the North County. Uh, the instructional building that will be here on this campus, the campus center at North County, uh, repairs and upgrades, uh, roofs, HVAC systems, uh, aquatic center, and then technology upgrades, a little bit of money this year for technology upgrades, most of that will come in the next series, and then uh, debt retirement. We paid off, we had three COPs, there are three different loans, we paid off one of those COPs, we're going to pay off the second COPs with the second issuance, and then also at that same time, the third COPs will, will be making the last payment. So by the, uh, 2018, we'll have paid off all three of the COPs. Yeah. And then the, <laughs> and the third and fourth issuances are on here. So good morning, and uh, excuse my uh, Rudolph the Red Nose Rainier imitation. Um, as we brought up before, Ed Code uh, 17292 required us to remove um, all of the structures that were non-compliant. And starting next Tuesday, you'll see the demolition starting on the North County campus. And we expect all those facilities to be gone in about four weeks. So things are moving pretty quickly. Um, if I mean, I'm sure you guys have noticed the structures um, that are in place, but uh, they total 23,320 square feet. And uh, we, we put those up in about four months. So it, it seemed to work out pretty good. Um, we stopped most of the leaks, and uh, you know we got most of the HVAC going. We still have a little bit more to do, but uh, thank you for being patient with us on that. No, just... The tag team. This one. That, oh, <laughs> maybe I should have included that in my cheat sheet here. Um, in July of last year, we took um, both the instructional building and the uh, North County Campus Center to TSA in Oakland. Um, we've faced some challenges with DSA in the last two months. Um, our plans were moved from Oakland to Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles is a pretty notorious uh, office for being um, somewhat difficult to deal with. Um, we, we made some phone calls and uh, have received a lot of cooperation um, from that office. And the instructional building um, is planned to come out of DSA on Tuesday and be prepared for bidding. And approximately four weeks later, the campus center will be coming out of uh, uh, DSA. Um, uh, we're about two weeks ahead of time on the instructional building, and we're running right about on time on the campus center. So. OK, after we passed the bond, we got into the planning stages. And Terry talked about fence fatigue as something we'll have because of all the fences. We on campus over a 12-year period, people start getting tired of seeing fences. I can say I already have fence fatigue from planning the first two major fences we have coming up. Uh, the first one's at the North County campus. And the problem with the fencing is you have to fence off such a large area to build a building. So the fence has to be at least as far away as the tallest point on the building in case something was to fall down. And then also you have to have room for all the, the construction equipment, all the supplies, materials that are going to come in, all the vehicles that come in and out. So we had to fence off a large area. We did have several meetings with several different groups to try to do the best we could with arranging the fences. But unfortunately, especially at the North County, it's just a big area that has to be fenced off. But what we did, this was the best. You can see on the dotted line, this is uh, the best plan we could, we could do. Um, it's hard to see on, on this slide, but right here is a, is a service road that's above the parking lot. So all the construction vehicles, trucks, bringing in supplies will be on that, that road. So it won't interfere with the students and, and faculty staff in the parking lot. Um, because the fence separates the, the old parking lot from all the existing structures over here, there's a path that goes along the bottom there. That's the pathway that people can take to get over there. 
I know the parking lot goes all the way up into here, and just unfortunately there's no way to get from here to here without crossing the construction site. So those people will have to walk all the way around. It's still, a, it's not a, a really long hike, but it's, it's not short. So I'm sorry about that, but that's the best we could do. And this is another picture aerial view of where the, the North County uh, Campus Center is going to go. It's right in the middle in, in the color. Um, a point with the construction fences and the construction sites, you're, you're probably seeing this deluge of construction alerts coming out. Um, the reason why we do that is because everybody, different people have different um, sections of campus that affects them and different things impact different programs, noise, dust, traffic. Um, we believe those construction alerts are important. And if nothing else, if you just glance over them when they come out, it'll tell you any, any environmental impact that's happening in that construction site will come out in a construction alert. If we're going to be bringing up noise for, for driving in piles, or if we've got um, a lot of construction traffic, it will come out in a construction alert. So you know, if, if you see something changing in the environment and you're going, what's going on, go look back a, a day or a week, and you'll see the construction alert that's going to address that. So just, just keep, keep uh, an eye open for that. Um, also, um, one of the things that, could you go back one? Um, the construction fence, well, actually, maybe one more, please. I mean, you're doing great. Uh, he's so good at that. I mean, that's, yeah. Um, you'll see that the construction fence borders right up along um, the ECE building. And actually, um, we do have a, an impact zone on the 24, or, or on the temporary structures. We have sound attenuation blankets. We have dust control um, measures put in place to try to help mitigate construction uh, issues, though they'll still be there. And um, you know, if something seems completely out of ordinary, you know, by all means, give a call over to the shop. Um, we threw in a couple pictures of the um, the new North County campus. I know you guys have seen it before. Just kind of freshen up, so you guys know uh, what to expect here in the next about 20, 20 months or so. That's just the view from the corner of Dallins and Buena Vista. That's the front entrance to the building. Um, and that is the free, uh, free span staircase going to the second floor. When you're looking through, the glass area in the back is the cafeteria. Um, top left is uh, Maria Escobedo's office, which is in a great place. And then all the student, student cent, uh, services uh, functions upstairs. Oh, and that is a picture of the cafeteria. And that is, I mean, that is the design. That's what it sh should look like if we do our job right. This is uh, the map of the slow campus where the instructional building is going to go. It's right here. Uh, zoomed in version is here. Once again, with the fences, we ran into a difficult time where to place them. Uh, this one, it's because it's so close to existing buildings. So, and we have to have access to the construction site. So unfortunately, we had to take a, a parking lot off campus or off, off line right here to dedicate it to the construction vehicles. Also, we, we did leave room so that you can, so that people can walk around this way, or they can also walk on the street side to get around to wherever they need to go. And this is a view, another top view of, of the building, how it's going to be situated around the other buildings. We, we have had some questions as far as the parking lot um, five, uh, five A, if you will, if it's going to come back. It will come back. It's going to be a shortened version of it. We're going to lose about, I don't know, 10 parking spots. And we're also going to enlarge parking lot four over towards an engineering building. So we'll, we'll gain um, actually more parking spots than, we, than we've lost with this, with this job. A um, couple quick shots of, of the uh, instructional building. That is the view from the Children's Center. Uh, we kind of had a, uh, a joke last time that that Staircase is hurricane rated, but it actually is. So, in the case of a hurricane, um, we should all maybe go there. <laughs> and, and then that's going to be a view, um, I believe that's coming from the 2300 building, uh, looking over towards the side of the building with the end being the children's center. And so, um, a lot of shading. Uh, so one, a lot of the concerns that we had from instructors on this, on this building is to make sure that the, the teaching location didn't get uh, direct sunlight. 
and that um, the students weren't having to battle with AV, and uh, the building does a good job doing that. Me again. Um, upcoming projects, um, North County Campus Center, we, we hopefully will be breaking ground um, early April. Uh, the Campus Center is an 18-month project, um, so you'll see significant, 18 months for a 40,000-square-foot 40, building is just about what it takes, so there's going to be a lot of activity. Uh, gr groundbreaking starts um, uh, next week. We already have contractors on board and ready to go on that. Um, and we spoke of dust and noise, but we should have uh, construction alerts out there letting you know if there's any, uh, any issues with that. Dust should not be an issue. It's part of a mitigating measure that we're required to take care of. Noise, we may have to work a little bit with. Um, the San Luis Obispo uh, Instructional Building, uh, as I said, we, sh we should go out to bid. Uh, starting construction, hopefully, uh, if all goes good with the bidding process, in April also. It's a 16-month project. And as we all know, it's right in the middle of our campus. So um, we'll again be working with noise and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, we believe it's going to be a, a great building. Um, 4200 the roof, uh, welding shop. That was one of the buildings that we were trying to get done at the very, very start of, um, of the bond. We found it a little bit of a challenge because the program needs were a little bit higher. We had a, um, an HVAC concern in the building that we needed to improve. And to do that, we had to pull the building back out of, of planning and replan for not only just the roof, but HVAC. We expect to be out of uh, design and go into construction this summer um, to be ready with a new ventilation system and roof for fall. Um, and then the aquatics uh, center, um, one thing that we have found is our pool is doing a really good job holding water right now. Um, not really what we want it to do with the rains and the construction we've got going on, but it is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, we will be going out for uh, qualification, uh, requesting qualifications for consultants uh, to redesign our pool for a complete remove and replacement in about four years. So that's what we have planned coming up. Well, and, and my quest uh, in the center there for construction alerts It'll list up to 15, and anything current on the, the bond website as a construction alert will be automatically will feed over to this new channel. Also, if you want to see some of the, the old construction alerts, you want to go back on the right side in the, the rectangle there is links to the Measure L website, which will take you to here, to the bond website. The address, again, is uh, questacollegebond.info. And if you click under at project information construction alerts, it will list all the construction alerts that we've done going all the way back. And we're going to end today with an update on our water use. You remember from the last opening day, I, uh, we did a water use presentation about uh, the governor's mandate that was issued in April of 2015. The governor mandated that we, re that we reduce our water by 25% from what we used in 2013, which was 129 and a half acre feet. And so that limited this year, our, we could only use up to 97.15 acre feet. And how much is an acre feet? Uh, one acre foot of water is about 325,000 gallons, over 325,000 gallons. So we needed to save 10 and a half million gallons of water. And we didn't get this until April, and it was for the calendar year. So we're already four months in, and we still have to save that much water. So uh, some of the measures um, that we did do is we replaced um, a water-cooled chiller in the North County. It's, it, it was a system that actually required the use of water to cool um, the North County buildings, and we, we switched that over to an air-cooled um, style chiller. The, the larger, uh, actually it was a supplemental chiller that we put in place of a very, very large water-cooled chiller. And that's been carrying the campus now for about um, seven months. We're just now starting a project of replacing the water-cooled chiller up in North County with a chiller capable of handling the full load of the campus for all 12 months. So we'll have two air-cooled chillers and no water-cooled chillers in the North County campus, saving a considerable amount of, uh, of water. Um, as you can see on campus, we've reduced a significant amount of turf. Um, we, uh, during this measure, we stressed the lawns that we had in place. Um, 
the gr grounds department was really good to, to take them to a point where they looked kind of stressed but not dying, and we've maintained them for that point, including the athletic fields. Um, we removed a fair amount of lawns that weren't immediately impacting student, uh, student learning, student um, uh, environment. Um, we inst uh, are in the process and have already installed um, uh, low flow um, water fixture, you know, bathroom fixtures, toilets, uh, urinals, and, and sinks. You're, you're going to notice those little those push button sinks that everybody loves so much because you hit them and they go off and they'll, they'll be all over campus. They save a tremendous amount of water. Um, and um, also, um, we changed what we used to do is do monthly meter checks. We, we meter all of our water on campus and we moved our checks up to weekly so that if we had any significant breaks that we didn't see, we could spot them faster. And um, that we're going to continue that um, for the foreseeable future. Here are some examples of some uh, areas that used to be lawns and they've been converted to uh, low water use landscaping. This is in front of the 3300 building. They have wood chips and some trees that will mature and nice looking trees. This is in front of building 2100, similar uh, with river rock and wood chips. So how do we do? The year's over, how do we do? This is uh, historical data. The green line on each month is the current year, 2015, compared to what we did in prior years. And we got the mandate in April. We didn't really start until May. So from May on, you could see we saved 50% or more for most of the months. Uh, by implementing these measures. Overall for the year was a 44% reduction out of 25. <laughs> that, that, that's equivalent to 16.4 million gallons of water. Also equivalent to about 25 Olympic sized pools worth of water. It's pretty good. And also, I wanted to give a special thanks to our grounds department, who's done a wonderful job. I remember last year when I told Terry he can't use water to water the lawns anymore, I was worried how the grounds department would react, because I know they take a lot of pride in, in the way our campus looks, which is why it looks the way it does. And they've done a great job uh, with the new landscaping. It looks as good or better than it did before, and so I'm really, really happy with them and, and proud of the work they've done. Thank you. Hey, good morning again. I'm back. <laughs> at, at this time, I'd like to welcome Dean uh, John Cascamo, Chief of Police Joe Artiaga, and Sergeant Jason Hopkins to help me with this next presentation. Here's the agenda of topics we're going to cover today. Uh, one of the, the main topics going around right now that's a lot of concern on campus is active shooters. We were going to do a, a section on that, but we decided that we just don't have time to properly address the, what it takes to do a real active, uh, active shooter training. We are, uh, the Chief and uh, Sergeant Hopkins are doing uh, Act, well, they're doing emergency preparedness training around campus, but a big part of that is active shooters. It, they found it works best in groups of 20 to 30, and they also found that it helps to go out to where the people are working, so they will come to you so that they can do it at your location and answer questions about how it works with your, with your building. I highly recommend everybody does it. They're going to be offering the trainings throughout the spring semester, and they can off they're willing to come to whatever place works best for you and whatever, uh, whatever time. So they can do it all throughout the semester to try to get as many people trained as possible. I went through the training uh, a couple weeks ago and I kind of, I know active shooters is a scary topic and there's some scary subjects in it, but it kind of, looking back on it, it kind of reminded me of earthquake training we did as, a, as kids. Um, 
There's some really simple things you can do to, to dramatically increase your chances of surviving an earthquake. The same is true with active shootings. Uh, there's some really simple things you can do to really increase your chances of surviving. Even though I think um, an active shooter on our campus, is the, the risk of that is pretty low. I hope it never happens. But this training also applies to wherever you go. So if you're in, in LA, San Francisco, the movie theater, wherever, the training you can take with you. So once again, I highly recommend everybody gets trained on the, the new campus emergency procedures. A little bit about our, our safety here at Cuesta College. We have a sworn police office, a sworn police department. That means that our officers on Cuesta receive the same training as any other law enforcement personnel. They have the same post certifications. We have seven sworn officers here on campus. They have agreements with all the local law uh, agencies. So if there is an emergency, they can respond just like any other police officer. Um, just this year, we even responded uh, to a Tascadero High School was one of our calls. They went all the way out there to help. And our, our department strives to be a, physical, a visible presence on campus. They, you'll see them walking around. Um, hopefully, that serves as a deterrent and also to make people feel, feel safer. Real quickly, I'll run through uh, who we have with us. Um, Chief Ortega comes to us 31 years of experience with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. He's also, he was the director of security for Universal Studios and theme parks for six years. I th that was a good match for us because theme parks and community colleges, <laughs> a lot of the same, uh, a lot of the same dyna dynamics. Um, Sergeant Hopkins here has 14 years experience here at Cuesta. He's fully certified, post-certified, basic, intermediate, advanced, uh, EMT. He's currently working on his bachelor's degree. We have in the North County, the officer we have in North County is, uh, I heard is North, North County Eric, they call him, uh, Officer George. He comes three years experience with the Sheriff's Department in Fresno. 18 years, Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department. Uh, he's the main presence up on North County. He, he's one person, but he's a big, big presence. So, <laughs> so don't mess with Eric. <laughs> and also we have uh, Officer Lopez, Officer Severin, and Officer Stenson. I'd like to point out the years here is the years they've worked at Cuesta, not their total years of experience. They also have uh, very impressive resumes. And we have one vacancy uh, we're in the process of replacing right now. And you're up. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to talk about the parking regulations um, and try and dispel that evil we allow two weeks before we start issuing citations rumor. Um, the first week of the semester is the only grace period that we have. This allows students and staff time to buy their permit, get it put on their windshield before the second week comes when we start issuing citations. Um, and we do not have any guest or visitor parking. So you guys know we have 20 minute zones. They are strictly enforced or you need to purchase a daily permit and display it on your dashboard with the date facing up. It's a very important part. Isn't it? Dr. Clear, you only have one week. The uh, reason we mentioned that is when we're opening, well, I think open with, is that 40% of the time, 40% of the time, our first three weeks, we have written for the appeal. The reason for the appeal, my instructor, my advisor, my whoever, said that I had two weeks, three weeks, a month, whatever, to get my, my permit. So we kind of like to eliminate all those, and hopefully the students will not get the citations that they, they've been getting so far. So remember, it's only one week, the first week, and after that, we do issue the citations. Thanks. Oh, you advanced already. Um, there's a national campaign that's, that's happened since 
Um, and it's basically, if you see something, say something. And it may be something that you think is really small, but it's from the small things that we discover big things. When the Oklahoma City bombing occurred, um, they had no clues as to who, was, who were the perpetrators were. And it, so, it took some Oklahoma state trooper who stopped a guy for not having um, the correct registration on his vehicle that led to discovering everything about it. So that's a really small thing. Even in law enforcement, um, uh, in our view, it's a really small thing. But it led to big things. And I cannot tell you how many times during the course of my career that people have said, you know, now that I think about it, I saw this, and I saw this, and I saw this. And when the event occurs, then everybody adds it up, adds up. But we want you to report it as early as you can. And um, we're not going to say, oh, you know what, we don't think we need to roll on that. We're going to roll, and then we'll decide whether it's, it's a big thing or not. But please let us know. And this especially applies when it comes to students. You see, students acting kind of weird. Please let us know. That will prevent, um, hopefully, we'll, we'll prevent something later on from occurring. Uh, once again, uh, make sure that no matter how small it is, please call us. Thank you. This is pretty important. Um, one of the most important things that I ask of you is if you're calling to report an incident to our dispatcher, please don't call and just and say, this is happening in my room, send someone now, click and hang up. Why it's so important to stay on the phone with dispatch is we need to know what we're walking into. We need to know color of shirt, color of pants, is he wearing a hat, glasses, male, female, was, did, was he displaying a weapon, was it a knife, was it a gun? We need to know all of this information so when we walk into that room, we know what we're walking into. It's not only for our safety, it's for your, your safety as well. Um, so that's very important. Stay on the phone with our dispatcher and she, until she tells you that you can hang up. Um, and please don't use code words. Um, some departments have code words in their, in their department that mean something to them. Um, I won't give the example that I usually give because that department is in here and <laughs> but um, just don't call us and say, you know, blah, 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 which means something in your department. It means absolutely nothing to us. Um, clear text. Let us know what you're saying, and um, we'll respond accordingly. And um, also, if, if the person is there that you're calling about and you can't really answer the questions that we need you to answer, we'll try and tailor those questions to yes or no answers. So you can give us some information. Probably not all that you could if you could tell us, but you can give us some of the information that we're walking into. And that's it. John? I have the next part. And the title of this slide is Signs of Student Distress. I want you to take a mental picture of this slide, and I want you to put it in your mind. And I want you to categorize it so that if you see someone in distress, you'll have a quick running list of what those different distresses could be. Now that you've taken a picture of it and it's in your mind, I want you to take a red pen and I want you to cross out distress and I want you to replace it with invitations to help. When a student behaves or displays any of these, I want you to consider these an invitation to help the student. I think that changes the frame of reference of how you approach the student, and I think that puts you in a, a position to have a very positive outcome. Because yes, all of these could be foreboding signs of something really, really terrible. They can also be just indications that a person is having a time-limited, very ordinary rough spot in their life. Either way, the student deserves some help and assistance through that. Some of these, uh, again, if my work deteriorates, I'm asking my faculty member to check in with me. I'm asking them to help me as a student. If I'm missing assignments or appointments, I'm asking you to check in about what might be going on in my life. 
And if you go through the entire list with that, I think you'll see that all of these are indeed invitations to help. When we talk about physical or psychological signs, I want to even up the ante. If I'm having excessive anxiety, probably if I knew how to get rid of that anxiety, I would get rid of it. Because it's very, very debilitating and uncomfortable to be in that situation. So that's why I want to be able to have you tell me, did you know student services has counselors available? Do you know we have people who can talk to you and connect you with resources? So if you approach this list with that mindset, I think we'll be serving our students in a much, much better way. And all of that is just simple rules of student engagement that is associated with a whole host of positive academic outcomes. You don't have to be an expert in mental health to really make a difference in a student's life. The person most capable of reaching and having a positive impact on a student is an alert individual, whether it's a faculty, a staff member, a counselor, or any position on campus, who notices that there's a change in the student's behavior and takes the time to engage them with conversation. And that conversation just doesn't stop, but it leads to a referral, a referral to student services, a referral to a counselor, and your willingness to follow up. Hey, did you actually take the time to make that appointment? Can I provide you more assistance? Can I go with you? There is a student well-being incident report. It's available on the web. Sandy, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it's on your page, I believe. At one point, that was really used the majority of the times uh, for discipline related. It's still totally appropriate for that, but it's also right now a tool that we have. If you're seeing something and you believe that this invitation of help needs to be answered with a formal uh, a referral to student services, this is the mechanism in which to use that. Sandy took the time to call me when she found out that I was going to be presenting on this, and she said, please stress the importance that this shouldn't just be in an anonymous form that's just sent off to student services, kind of like what Officer Jason talked about. If we get a call and we don't know what we're walking into, it's very, very difficult to engage that situation. Well, imagine if student services gets a form this student is having these signs uh, and, and go deal with it. So much better if as a faculty member, as a staff member, as a concerned individual, you tell a student, hey, I'm noticing these different things and I want to help you out. I'm going to let student services know they're going to be contacting you. And if I can help, you know, please let me know. That really sets the stage for student services to have a quality and meaningful interaction with the student. Uh, of course, we realize that there may be times when you see something that's so immediate and profound that it may be a, a risk to their safety or the safety of others. In those situations, you need to get on the phone and call the police department and then inform student services of the situation. That's the broad overview I want to uh, provide regarding students in distress or students who are asking you to help uh, in their life. Are there any questions on this? Thank you. Just to tag on to what John just said, extremely important if you let us know and fill out those student incident reports. 61% of the mass shootings in the United States occur at businesses or, or educational institutions. It's a lot, of, it's majority of the, of the shootings. In almost, uh, I shouldn't say in almost every, but in a vast majority of the cases, there was a history of this where people said, yeah, you know what, he was treated and especially when it comes to the educational institutions. So please assist us in preventing those from occurring by, by completing these forms. Building alarms. Uh, building alarms, I apologize to the people working in 31, 32, 33, 34, because they've been the victims of the student that goes in and starts vaping. And as a result, we've had to evacuate those buildings many times over the past couple of months. Um, it gets to be a habit where some of the people say, you know what, I don't need to evacuate. You really do. Um, it's heavy fines involved. Uh, plus, you don't know for sure if it's somebody vaping or if there's an actual fire. So please evacuate the building. Have your students and your personnel grab their stuff as long as it doesn't delay them. You can go ahead and grab your stuff, but please evacuate and head on out to the evacuation areas. We have signs along each of the doorways 
and along some of the major hallways directing you to your evacuation points. Um, also, uh, if the fire department decides to come in, and they do come in when, they, when, they, uh, when these alarms go off, they can issue citations, and we're not talking parking citations that are only like three or four hundred. We're talking citations that are about five to ten thousand dollars, and they will issue them to the person in charge of that room personally. That's not a school citation. That's you, because you're the one responsible. And then the ones for the schools are much bigger. So please remember to to evacuate. Everybody takes this seriously. Questlove College is a minimum three company response. So we have engine companies from three places, sometimes four or five, because we are a high priority target for uh, responses. So once again, evacuate, and then we'll check out and make sure that everything's good. Thank you. I'm here to talk about the cell system. I'm sure you've all seen the lights popping up all over campus. This is our new notification system. It kind of came online in December, I believe. Um, there's usually a light diagram by and that tells you what the lights mean. Um, on the top is red. And if that red light flashes, it's going to be accompanied by an audible alarm that is a big siren that's on top of the roof of the 31, 3200 building. Um, so if the light is flashing and you hear an audible alarm, that means you need to evacuate. If the red light is solid, that means that you need to lock down or shelter in place. Um, usually when I make this presentation, I follow it up with, you'll see it later on in the presentation, how to do this. However, we're now presenting the active shooter presentation. So locking down simply means that you're going to want to secure your door, lock your door, turn your lights off, silence your cell phone, not turn them off, just silence them. Um, Put any sort of chairs, uh, tables, desks, whatever it may be, up against the door to prevent anyone from coming in. <clears throat> the amber light is um, for a regroup message. The amber light comes on, that means you're going to be getting a regroup message. I assume everyone in here signed up for regroup, right? OK, good. Um, I'll go into how to sign up for that later on. The white light will always be on. It just means everything's status quo, everything's all good. And then the green light will come on after the solid red light um, comes on. So the solid red light comes on, you're locked down. When the danger's passed, the green light will come on telling you you can resume your duties. The lock block. I'm sure everybody has seen these. <clears throat> these were initially put in, um, and they were designed to be an anti-distraction device. Um, so in classrooms, you don't hear the turning of the doorknob or the slamming of the door when the student comes in and it interrupts the class. We took it a step further, <clears throat> and they're somewhat of a security measure, I guess you could say. Lock block's a really simple device. It's a little T-shaped looking gizmo that slides in between the door and the door jam. Yes, that's a technical term, gizmo. Um, the most important thing to remember with a lock block, however, is you need to secure the lock on the outside of the door before engaging the lock block, or else you're defeating the purpose. So you come to your class in the morning or your, your room in the morning, you want to make sure you unlock your door, relock your door, and engage the lock block. The reason why is, if that solid red light comes on and you need to lock down, it's a lot easier to slide that lock block to the right, the door has to close about that much, and you're secured in your room, rather than having to go outside of your door and expose yourself to whatever danger is out there that we're trying to prevent you from exposing yourself to, locking your door, going back inside, and shutting it. It's a really simple device, a uh, really good device, actually. Regroup. There we go. So for those of you who are not signed up on Regroup, it's very simple. It's on your MyQuesta homepage. You scroll all the way down to the bottom and click on the little link next to the My Alert symbol. That'll take you to a blue page with a username and password. You sign into that page 
with the same username and password that you did for your MyQuesta. That'll take you to the regroup page. And at the top, they have checkboxes. The two checkboxes that we would like you to check is how you want to be contacted. And that's text message and email. You check those two boxes, you scroll down to the bottom, you click save, and you're signed up for regroup. <clears throat> now, regroup is our mass messaging emergency alert system, basically. Um, we not only send out regroup messages for bad things that are happening. If there's a massive power failure and classes are canceled, we'll send out a regroup message saying classes are canceled so you don't have to waste your gas driving all the way out here and find out for yourself that classes are in fact canceled. Um, again, the amber light on the cell system, when that comes on, it'll be followed by one of these messages that you'll receive as a text message or an email giving you instructions on what to do next. I think. Yep, Joe's next. Yes, sir. Correct. Especially that red flash. Also, if you ever do notice it's unplugged, call public safety right away so that they can come and investigate it and make sure nothing's about to happen. Chief Artiaga? Hello? Up here in North County. Can you do me a favor and um, repeat those questions that were asked by the audience? We couldn't hear them up here, please, and the answer. Thank you. Hi, Maria. Uh, one of the questions was that the lights are plugged in, and they were wondering if there was some sort of a backup system if the light becomes unplugged. And uh, I told her that no, there was not. However, facilities may be working on hardwiring them. And Todd's question was, Message, message. Exactly. Um, <laughs> whenever a light comes on on the cell system, it's assumed and it should be followed by a regroup message. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> red books, the famous red books. These should be in every classroom. They should be in every gathering point, and they should be in any room that you think they should be in. If they're not, please notify us. We have extra ones. We'd be more than happy to either place them in the rooms permanently or give them to your staff for reference. Special emphasis on the quick reference. That's what these books are for. They're not, they don't provide all the detail in any one situation, but they certainly provide enough information to get you through any emergency that you're likely to, to um, have to face on campus. We do more uh, training regarding the books at our training that was referred to earlier. But we would like you to pay special attention to that very first page. It's a list of all the phone numbers of the fire departments, ambulance services, and local police departments. We would especially like you to pay attention to the direct number to uh, public safety on both campuses because the standard is to dial 911, and just so that you're aware, because a lot of people aren't, when you dial 911 in all 58 counties in California, the first place that answers that phone is the local CHP office. Their operators are then trained, once they talk to you for a little bit, to reroute the call directly to the law enforcement agency, and then they respond. So if you dial us directly, we're going to get there faster. Plus, it's, it, it's really embarrassing when, when I remember one occasion I was talking to Dr. Stork and the ambulance pulls up right next to us and he says, 
So what's going on? Uh, I don't know, because people didn't call us. So um, please call us first. And we have two uh, officers that are EMT trained, so they will take care of the medical portion, and the rest of us will take care of any other issues that you might have. So please call our number first. Once again, if you need more of these, please call us. And um, if you have any questions, you can call us anytime. We don't have to wait for training. We don't have to, to do a training session. Just call us, and we'd be more than happy to answer any of the questions. Thank you. We made it to the last slide. <laughs> um, just some of the services that we provide. Um, if you lock your keys in your car, we have the equipment to unlock your vehicle and recover your keys for you. And we don't charge anything for this. Um, also, you know, those foggy mornings, you turn on your headlights to drive to work and you forget to turn them off and your battery's dead, we can jumpstart your vehicle. <clears throat> also, if you're uh, working late at night and it's dark or maybe you're injured and you can't make it to your vehicle or you don't feel comfortable walking to your vehicle in the dark, Give us a call. We'll come pick, you up in our, come pick you up in our snazzy little golf carts and give you a ride. Um, and then also, we are the lost and found for the campus. Um, and we ask that if you find any, especially any high dollar items, that you return them to us as soon as you can, because there's no doubt that the student or staff member that's lost those are frantically looking for them. Um, Generally, it takes a week or two for that property to get returned to us. And the student comes in every day frantic. Have you found it yet? Have you found my iPhone yet? So just try and get them to us as soon as you can. Um, and the lost and found is located in our new building, 6600A, right next to our old building. Um, and that's all I've got. And just one more time, I'd like to really encourage everybody to sign up for the training that they're, they're going to be doing throughout the semester. It's really worthwhile. And next, I'd like to present Vice President McLaughlin, who's going to talk about student success. Okay. Hello, hello. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Lots of good information. I chose this slide for you to see first because this is my daily inspiration from my home in Creston. And in watching this image one day and thinking about the comments to make to you, uh, just the, the shape of this image reminded me of a training that I had attended recently and led me on this particular way to organize my thoughts. It's interesting up here, you can see lots of activity from this perspective. So, uh, and I think for me, it's really odd to uh, have this as my last opening day and as my last embarking on my last semester at Cuesta College. So part of what I wanted to do is talk to you about what's important in my perspective for you to consider in the future. So I think if you have spent a career in student services, uh, you quite often hear the words uh, and the labels of kind of touchy-feely. Now, not the HR type, but kind of that fuzzy, squishy, touchy-feely stuff that student services does, and the fact that we have a lot of funny money. So what I decided to do today is to own those labels and to see if I might shed a light on them in a way that will want you to be more a part of those labels. So let's start with touchy-feeling. Now, I think there is now redemption for touchy-feeling. I have been so encouraged by the work of the Institutional Effectiveness Partnership Initiative in calling renewed attention to RP research that was associated with student support redefined study on six success factors. So nearly 900 community college students were interviewed and described the most important reasons they progressed towards their educational goal. The researchers grouped these into six categories with the conclusion 
and this is a really significant conclusion, that students are more likely to achieve their goals when six, these six success factors are present. And these are students telling us what matters to them, what motivates them um, in terms of how they behave. When I look at these six factors, I say, yes, this is touchy-feely. This is the business of student services, and it really is the business of Cuesta College. There's so much pressure on all of us for accountability and data-driven decision-making that sometimes we get lost in all of that, even me. These six elements are an important reminder to all of us of the human element behind our data, that our data is our way of organizing the outcomes of how students behave. Students are telling us that these six factors have the greatest influence on how they behave in a college setting. And this might be a simplistic thought, but let's reflect for a minute that when students are achieving their goals, the college is receiving ours, achieving ours. So when we, uh, we need to give attention to these when we're thinking about and talking in groups about persistence, you know, first a semester, persistence, first to second year persistence, ESL basic skills improvement and success, course completion, degree and certificate completion, transfer preparedness. If we are earnest in meeting our institutional goals, I think we need to be in the habit of asking ourselves, does this program or initiative provide clear direction to the students? Does it help? students to stay focused and stay on track? Does our delivery communication to students um, reflect that we want them to succeed? Did we design a means for students to be actively involved, engaged, and connected to our college community? And do we express our appreciation for students' skills, talents, and abilities? So let's move on to funny money. Funny money is, you know, traditionally is talked about the money that's over there. You know, John actually knows about this. He has some too, but we'll pretend most of it's in student services. So it's the stuff that's over there. We know, we've kind of heard about it. We know that there's financial aid, administration money, DSPS, EOPS, CalWORKs, health center fees, student center fees. And so we know they have a lot of money over there and they do a lot of things that we really don't understand. The game changer really is now that there are more broadly defined restricted funds and the big one, the student success and support funds that have now reached here at Cuesta College over $1.7 million. And that combined with student equity funding of $800,000, we're at a total of over $2.5 million just here at Cuesta College in these broad reaching restricted dollars. I believe that we embarked on this journey when we defined our institutional objectives back when, and it's clear that in administering these funds as well as meeting our college goals, that to be successful in supporting student success and addressing student equity, that we all need to work effectively together across the district uh, in order to move us in the direction we need to go. In the strategic plan, when we defined our objectives and our associated strategies and action steps, it wasn't a clean process. We discovered that in order to deliver these institutional objectives, there couldn't be just one responsible party for each objective. That would have been nice and clean. But under the same objective, we're assigned to academic affairs, research, student services, computer services, activities all under the same objective. It's very messy, but it forces us to work together in new and different ways. And this journey was accelerated with the implementation of the Student Success and Support Plan and the Student Equity Plan. In the Student Support and Success Plan, there are orientations that meet all those three SP qualities that um, are out there in Allied Health and ESL and where instructors are involved. And I need to tell you that Cuesta College is somewhat unique. Uh, across the state, uh, most of the student equity programs are under the auspices of student services, and that's because they're associated with the Student Success Act, Student Success Funding. But it was intentional on my part, uh, and really about my caring for the future of Cuesta College, 
that I suggested um, that the responsibility for the student equity plan be headed by the leader of the Student Success Center, which is under academic affairs, because it was clear to me that the strong student equity initiative, it was, if it was really going to reach and support our students, needed to include the instruct, instructional faculty component and endorsement. And to me, in order for this to happen, it really needed to be uh, in academic affairs, which ultimately we would all be working together to achieve these goals. It's a learning process, but we, I believe, we're moving in the right direction. So I get to talk about one of my favorite projects right now, which is, we call it Degree Works. It now has a new, uh, hipper name, My Quest of Pathway. To be honest, one of my motivations for applying for this position was the thought that maybe finally I could have a part of making sure that this uh, actually came to fruition. It's something so many of us have wanted to happen for such, such a long time. And now it's here. This was released to students in October. And how were we able to make this happen? Well, I'm proud to say that really, uh, primarily, it was because of funny money. This is three SP, a 3SP supported project, and also because of institutional will. The degree audit is uh, cited as a strategy in the strategic plan. You know, so many times I'm associated with the strategic plan, and I'm proud of that because, you know, there are so many pieces in there that now institutionally we're moving towards. So this is under Institutional Objective 1.2 to increase the number of degree or certificate directed students who complete degrees or certificates. So, the, um, so many, all, I, was, I started to write all three on here, but actually all of our clusters, there's actually four clusters, were involved. Computer services was there at every step of the way, designing all of the technical aspects and arranging for consultants to provide training. Admissions and records and counseling provided the leadership and expertise, and ultimately an A&R evaluator described every Quest of College catalog back to 2010-11. Before any of that could happen, though, I have to tell you there was a significant, and that's with a capital S, and painstaking curriculum cleanup that uh, directly involved academic affairs and student services and that all individuals pulled together in a really heroic way. I mean, this wasn't a minor effort. This was a tremendous effort, and we were able to deliver this project ahead of schedule. And now marketing is helping us with the launch. And just as significant for me is that this project hits all six of the RP success factors with top four being, being directed. Students have a goal, and they know how to achieve it. They are focused, they stay on track with their eye on the prize. This, can, this program continually, it's real time, it updates. Students can see where they are in the pipeline, where they are in progress. The students are engaged. They can pull this up online anywhere, and there's a cool what if component in here. And valued, because students have real time, accurate information. Students and counselors are all on the same page. So let's see if we can get the, uh, this to go. Okay, here we go. Yeah, man. Oh, I can't play the video. Okay. So, um, this is the landing page for my Quest of Pathway. And um, from here, there's a very cool video that marketing helped with that describes the, this project, and so if you haven't listened to that or watched that, I hope you go out and take a look at that. The, um, and then I'll go ahead and tell you, show you instead. Okay, come on. There we go. So when the student is out there looking at these, these pages have up-to-date, complete real-time information that tells them the broader scope of where they stand in terms of reaching their degree goal. And on this particular one, there's a gray bar that shows this person has completed 100% of all of those requirements. Uh, there's also, you'll notice other information on here, whether they're a veteran, so our uh, counselors are alerted to that and can give that kind of support, whether they are uh, an athlete, and so there's special regulations that, that come into play there. 
lots of really critical information, and students and the counselors can also make notes that other counselors can reference. So regardless of how many stops through time, um, we have one central uh, spot for all of that. And the part, one of the things that I really like the most is there's a what if feature that allows students to say, you know, as they're exposed to different instruction, different instructors, different ideas, what if I decided to go from psychology, psychology to kinesiology? What, you know, how far, how many more classes would I need? And these kinds of, these screens then can switch over for them. They can do this on their own. And they could say, well, you're still doing well up in this category, but when it gets down to that uh, degree specific, here are the courses that you still need. They tell you what the, uh, the name of the, co the course is, and it actually connects students to ClassFinder. So it's all very cool. So I'm actually going to go back. Gonna... We'll just have to hang there for a minute. So also part of this uh, project, which is still under construction, is the electronic student educational plan. And in that plan, uh, students will be planning out their sequence of how to meet what's missing in this report. But one of the components that I love about the student educational plan that's under construction right now is that it's also a survey instrument. And it's asking students the, their preferred modality and physical location so that we can better plan in terms of enrollment management. And students will certainly feel valued if we actually have adequate courses available when and where they need them. So this is, uh, this is a chart that is um, from the student equity plan, or was constructed from the student equity plan, that really calls out examples of plan collaboration and cooperation uh, district-wide in support of students. Recently, um, on this list, it talks about the reactivation of a cultural center. Recently, a team of us, including instructional faculty, student services, classified and management, attended an IEPI workshop at Hancock and fo that focused on the six success factors that I've called attention to today. At the end of the day, the, we, we were in workshops all day long, but they reconvened us. And at the end of the day, we were asked to identify a single project that we could bring back to our campus, our district, and implement fairly rapidly. Uh, the, the consensus, and it was a quick consensus, was that our project should be reinstatement of the Student Cultural Center, a place for student equity populations to feel that they matter, that they belong, that they have a sense of place and acceptance. The vehicle to deliver this is the reinstatement of a student activities director or a student activities assistant, excuse me, in the student life and leadership area that will design programming in the student cultural center and will work actively with students, thereby addressing engaged, connected, and valued. The CAFE program uh, reflects the fact that student equity research brings light to a group of individuals, our foster youth, who reflects significant disparity in their educational access and achievements. Foster youth are identified as a student equity population, and in creating the CAFE program, their support is added to CalWORKs, EOPS, and CARE to provide individualized attention and academic support without the stigma. Support services are planned to include academic coaching and peer mentoring along with more traditional services already in place, such as counseling and tutoring. An active foster youth advisory committee has already been formed and training conducted for foster youth providers. The key to success with CAFE is that these students will feel nurtured, that somebody wants and, and helps them to succeed and connected, that they will feel part of the college community. So in closing, my hope for all of you into the future is that you will embrace the touchy-feely and the funny money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to all of our presenters today, and thank you for your attention uh, to these uh, topics that affect all of us and allow us to uh, provide the right environment 
uh, for ourselves as employees, but also for our students, uh, and be prepared to be able to handle uh, situations that come before us. Um, <clears throat> if you look on your program, it talks about a, a president's message at this point. I really don't have a message today. Um, I gave most of the, what I really wanted to say to you to get it out in the open and get it off my chest. I said it in the opening. Um, <clears throat> and I was said with um, a degree of um, anxiety uh, because uh, we're all in um, a state of uh, wanting to feel valued, wanting to feel, wanting to feel appreciated. And one of the ways, one of the tangible ways that we demonstrate that is through the way in which we compensate people. And when we go through these very tough periods of time uh, economically, uh, and we're not having the ability to continually uh, improve our compensation or our contribution towards benefits, um, it does wear on people. Now, if you're fortunate enough and you're, you're within the body of your salary schedule and are, and are moving every year, you don't notice it as much. But for many of you and many of our senior employees, are, they've been at the top or the bottom of your salary schedule for a long time. And that's where it starts to feel uh, uncomfortable. It starts to feel when you see that your, you know, your discretionary income being eroded by increase in retirement, increase in uh, health benefits portion, um, it feels demeaning, and it has an impact on our ability to meet uh, our requirements of, being, uh, of having a, su a successive household. So I understand that. Our trustees understand that. And of course, um, uh, the, the kind of revenue that we are provided that is discretionary, that we can put into ongoing investments like salary compensation, comes from our revenue that we get from enrollment. And so enrollment, it really dictates what it is that we can do. Now, once in a while, uh, the governor's budget will include a cost of living adjustment, which we call COLA. We didn't have a COLA for like seven years. And just recently, the governor started to include COLA. But Remember, the, the concept of a cost of living adjustment is to help an organization adjust to inflationary costs that we're experiencing. What are our inflationary costs as an institution? We service the salary schedule. For those employees who have the opportunity to move a step on the schedule, either down or across, depending on what schedule you're on, or you move into longevity, or you're paid for out of class, or our utilities go up, the cost of doing goods and uh, the cost of goods and services change. That's what that's designed to, to pay for. So when we went through all those years of not getting a cost of living adjustment, we still had to pay for those improvements. And where does that come? It comes from continually to erode the operating budget. And that means cuts, cuts in all of our budgets. And in the extreme cases, it was in cuts of personnel. If you remember back in 2012, when the state was reducing our budget significantly, and they did that by reducing our paid cap, we were at a 9,600 paid cap status in 2010. And that, was from, that went from 9,600 immediately to 9,200 to 8,600 to 8,400. And every, for every one of those, uh, FTES, we lost $5,000. So for every 100 FTES, we lose a half a million dollars. So over the course of those years where the state was withdrawing uh, support for paid status, we were losing literally millions of dollars of income. How did we adjust to that? We eliminated about 300 sections of classes. That drove down our payroll. It impacted a lot of our part-time faculty in terms of having jobs or faculty who had enjoyed the opportunity to teach an overload. It affect teaching an overload, which affected their family income.
it affected our ability to, to manage the 50% law, a law that's been in place since the 1950s, which makes absolutely no sense today, where 50% of our revenue, our expenditures, have to be spent in the classroom on instruction, basically faculty salaries. So if we're driving down the cost of education by fewer dollars under the faculty side, guess what has to happen? We have to balance it by driving down the cost on the non-faculty side, which is in support services, uh, cost of goods and services, and people. Because we're a human intensive industry. We're people serving people. And that's the ugly part of having to, to uh, go through that process. So now the governor has included, in the last three years, uh, some fairly minor cost of living adjustments. We had like a 0.86%. This year we had a whopping 1.02%. In next year's budget, it is 0.47%. That doesn't cover any of our inflationary aspects. It won't cover the cost of servicing the salary schedule. There's money in for growth. But in order to get the growth, you've got to grow. And whether it's 2% or whether it's 3%, it doesn't affect us because the maximum that we can grow is only 1% because of the formula. The formula says that if your college was in an environment in which you have a highly educated citizenry, and there's some other factors, then you don't qualify. It's assuming that you've got so many people that already have an education, they don't need one. So we're not going to give you more money to add more classes to hire more people. It's so illogical, I just can't stand it. You know. So I'm only telling you this, and it's not I'm preaching to the choir for most of you, because you've heard these arguments, you've heard these explanations, you've attended a planning and budget committee meeting, you've heard these, these aspects. That's the reality of what we're dealing with. So when we go into negotiations, or when I meet and confer with management senate and the vice presidents, and we talk about what we can do, we're, we're stretching to the absolute maximum. I'm going to the board and say, saying, we need to do this because our employees deserve it, but this is what the consequence is going to be. This is what it's going to mean next year or the year after. So when people see our bottom line and say, gosh, we got you know, $8 million in reserve, and uh, you know, $5 million of that is in contingency. Well, if you spend that contingency, it's gone. It's your savings account. So if you spend a million, then you need another million next year to keep it going. And it goes on and on and on. So we have to really be mindful of that. We publish and we keep going. Uh, Vice President Green makes sure that we're looking on the outside. So the decision we make today, how is that going to impact tomorrow? We don't want to give away the store today because tomorrow then we have to tear the store down. And I'm not going to do that anymore. So, so when we wear buttons or we wear plaques and say, it's got to be fair. I'm just telling you, it is fair. It is fair for us. We can't compare ourselves to Hancock College or College of Sequoias or any of the comparable 14 that we use. Because what we're not comparing is our efficiency. How, how efficient are we in what we do? Our efficiencies don't compare to their efficiencies, which drive their resources. So we're going to, you know, there is a process um, in, in labor law when we go into negotiations, when we have two negotiation uh, units, CCFT for faculty and three, uh, CCCUE for classified employees, there is a process. We negotiate in good faith. And eventually we do our best and last offer. And if that's not acceptable, then we can either independently or mutually declare impasse. And we have mutually declared impasse, CCFT in the district and CCUE in the district. And now we're engaging in what that means. 
That means that we apply to PERB, which is the Public and Employee Relations Board. We apply to them to advance into mediation. Now, PERB can say no based on the information we give them. PERB can say, no, your, your, your statement isn't strong enough. You need to go back to the table and sit down and keep talking. Or they can say, yes, you qualify for uh, mediation. We have a mediation uh, appointment scheduled with faculty, which is on February 9th. So the state appoints a mediator, and that person will be coming here, who will then work between the district representatives and the faculty representative to see if we can come to an agreement. Now, we've come to agreement on all the language in the contract. That's not the issue. It's really down to compensation, which is usually what happens. We have not been given permission to go to mediation by, for, with classified yet, because not all the paperwork has been completed to PERB, so they can make a ruling on whether or not we can then uh, set up an assignment. So that's going to be a while. Um, meanwhile, I've taken a proposal to the trustees about management. I put a proposal on the table to, uh, in terms of the dollars available to Management Senate. They made a recommendation of what they'd like to see happen in terms of, of their, or, their particular organization. And I've made a recommendation to the board. They've accepted that. So now I'm meeting with the management and confidentials and supervisors on Wednesday of next week to give them the complete picture of what's going to happen. Then we're going to implement that. The same with the vice presidents. And you saw in that memo I sent to you what the outcome of those were. In my situation, I signed a new three-year contract with the board in starting July 1, which called for a 1% um, increase this year. So that's already been implemented in, as of July 1. So I'm a fat cat. You know, I'm a, I've been taken care of with my 1%. And uh, that's by contract. That's my negotiation with the, uh, with the trustees. So there's a process for each of the organizations. I do not believe in Me Too. Because everybody's different. Everybody has different needs. Everybody uh, has a different uh, demand for what they want to see happen to that, that pot of money, whether it be put on the salary schedule, whether it be some of it put into benefits, whether they want to implement a salary schedule or a salary survey. It's different for each group. So I don't, I don't do me too. I do what do you need and how best can we utilize the resources made available to you. So that's kind of where we are with the organization. I just want to, I don't want any mystery to be out there wondering what's happening. That's why I published that, that uh, statement on negotiations and where we were with each group. Now, you'll, you'll hear arguments about those numbers aren't accurate. It's not what it says it is. Um, it is what it is. Yeah. It's what's underneath those and where the, where the actual dollars are being considered to be placed, which is still under uh, discussion. I wanted to uh, thank Sandy, um, not only for her presentation today, for being a, such a great spirit in my life. You know, I didn't know who Sandy was. I just I found out she was this kid from San Inez, who went to San Inez High School, you know, and grew up and became a hippie or something. I don't know, weren't you a hippie for a while at one time? Oh, yeah. Went to UCSB and bounced around so on, ended up at Quest to college as a financial aid uh, and EOPS uh, director. Yeah. So, uh, and you came what year? 1986. Okay. So I was a dean of science and math at the time in 1986, but in 1990 I became vice president of student services. So I, then I started to discover who Sandy really was. And uh, at first I thought she was just a bulldog, you know. Because she was tenacious, she had an opinion, and uh, she wanted to make sure that I knew what that opinion was. Um, but I also had, what I also learned about Sandy was, she was so unbelievably passionate about students and about the college. And she had a dream. She had a dream about what she would like to see Cuesta become. She didn't know what her capabilities were. Because she wasn't a real outgoing, 
kind of confident type of person. She didn't go out and try to sell herself in terms of trying to impress you. She just did her work. So when, um, when the Dean of Student Services that I hired right after I became Vice President left us after a couple of years, um, I asked Sandy if she would step in and serve as the interim uh, dean. And she was not sure she wanted to do that. You know. But how could you resist my offer? You know. <laughs> and so she did say yes. And, um, and then I got a chance to really see you know, who, who Sandy was and what her capabilities were. Um, up to that point, there was kind of a, uh, a culture uh, in this institution that if you accepted an interim assignment, then you also agreed not to apply for the position so that it would not to appear that you have an inside track on the job. You have gained an unfair advantage. Well, fortunately, at about the time we were flying that position, uh, Dr. Mitchell, who was the president at the time, had a different philosophy on that. He says, heck no, we can do that. And so Sandy applied for the position, and, um, and I selected her for the Dean of Student Services. And then uh, mid-'90s, we were really ramping up uh, looking at developing a North County campus Moving out of Paso Robles High School, which we had maxed out, we were offering over 50 sections. We had 1,100, 1,200 student, evening students taking classes. Uh, and we were looking to move into a, a setting. And we found the property. We purchased the property in uh, Paso Robles, the Buena Vista site. Um, <clears throat> Pete Sizak, who skipped out on us, I'll make a note of that, that he left early. And got that, I have two witnesses on the board. Uh, he was our uh, police chief, but he was always keeping track of the surplus property at Vandenberg Air Force Base. And one day he walked in and said, hey, they've got all these modular buildings these, that they're going to surplus. And they just want to get rid of them. So we jumped on it and got about $2 million worth of modular buildings for $0. And, it had, and spent about a couple hundred thousand to move them to the North County. The foundation put on a wonderful community campaign, raised $4 million to create the infrastructure and modify those for classrooms, offices, and so on. Meanwhile, Dr. Mitchell asked me if I would come up with an administrative structure for that North County campus. And after I did my, my survey of all the colleges in California that had outreach centers or campuses, uh, basically, the model was a dean-level position. And so I made that recommendation to Dr. Mitchell. I said, you really need a dean. Well, at that time, we had you know, three instructional deans and the dean of student services. And we didn't have a climate, much like today, that we could just go out and add another administrator. You know, uh, it would not be a good idea right now. So we looked around and said, dean, dean, who's the best dean to go to North County? And I said, as much as I hated to lose Sandy, I said, Sandy's the, the most logical. She lives in the North County. She's embedded in the North County in terms of her orientation. She, you know, 90 percent of that job is going to be logistics and providing services to students. I said, she is the absolute right person. And so I made the recommendation. Sandy took on that and moved to the North County. And the success of our North County and its importance to those communities in North County. If you go into Paso Robles, you go to Tascadero, you talk about Cuesta College, that's their college. And they support it so tremendously in terms of their economic development plans. Whatever they do, they think of Cuesta College and how it can be a player in improving their economic development and their um, their recruitment of employees and families to move into that area. And much of the success of that I have to give to Sandy and her integration into that uh, community and with that, that culture in the North County. <clears throat> Some of you in here um, either had the, uh, the good fortune to have a finalist interview with me uh, before you were hired. And you know, one of my favorite questions to ask you was, 
what do you want Questa to be 5, 10, 15 years from now? What do you want, how do you want to impact what Questa will be? <clears throat> what do you want Questa, what is going to be your legacy that you can hang your hat on and say, you know, I feel so proud because I had a role in that? I see the evidence every day of the legacy that Sandy has provided, not only for herself, for all of us and all of the students. There's no, there's no mystery why there was a group of community and college supporters that went together to raise money to put a plaque in the North County Campus Library Building on the bridge when you walk in the library in honor of Sandy McLaughlin because she's an impact player. And we don't have many opportunities after today to say these kind of things, but Santa, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a, a very important part of my life and my professional career. And uh, we're going to get every damn ounce of work out of you between now and June 30th, so don't let it go to your head, you know. And we'll have to throw her out because she'll still be trying to finish that next report and move on to the next project. We'll even get her horse down here. She can ride off into the sunset, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, opening day is a time just to be together, to see colleagues, see people we haven't seen over the holidays or we see maybe once a semester, to say thank you to people like Karen Andrews. We were going to have our four honored alums here today so we could see what we produce as an institution and allow you, to, those of you who may have had contact with them, to see what they have become because of you and your part in their growth and their success. But we're saving that till April 1st, not because it's going to be an April Fool's Day joke, but that's the next event we have planning to honor our, our honor alums when our foundation has their awards luncheon here in 5401. Four amazing uh, people that we're very proud of. Um, they have tremendous respect for their opportunity that they were given here at Cuesta College. There's one from each decade, one from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Really kind of an interesting uh, mix of people. But uh, read about them. Uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to meet them. But they will be back, and they'll be here to say thank you to Cuesta College. And I want to say thank you on behalf of myself for hanging in there with us through the good times, the bad times, and the ugly times. Um, because there's no better place on this earth than here at Cuesta College and having the privilege of working with each and every one of you. So tape your ankles, because Tuesday morning they'll all be back. All right. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you.